This morning we're going to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 2. As we look at God's word here today, we're going to look at the visit of the Magi and have a few words of introduction to share about them. They're kind of some mysterious people. Uh, We sang We Three Kings and uh, we don't actually know how many there were, but we'll get into that. So let's open up God's word and see what God's word has to say and let that shape our lives this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 1. If you're using one of the worship Bibles that's in the pew in front of you, that's uh, page 807. And uh, follow along now as I read this God's Word, verses 1 through 12. Uh, please stand as well in honor of God's Word. Thank you so much. Just whispered that. <clears throat> now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their country by another way. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word, which tells us of this very peculiar journey of these wise men. We pray that as we take time to look into it and reflect upon it, that you would shape us to be more like the people, the disciples you're calling us to be in whatever stage of the journey that we are on. Bless us now as we receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, there are a number of things that happen after the birth of Jesus. And our way of celebrating Jesus' birth often culminates with Christmas Eve. And uh, the interesting thing is that Christmas actually began on Sunday last week, the 25th, and Christmas tide goes for 12 days of Christmas. So you've heard the song, The 12 Days of Christmas. They did not start on uh, December 13th or whenever that was. They actually began on December 25th. So we're full in the middle of Christmas right now. And the 5th of January, the 12th day, is called Epiphany. It is the day that we celebrate the king's arrival or the the wise men's arrival. We have a few different names that we call these guys, uh, the wise men. Uh, the Magi and the Kings. And uh, that's because we really don't know much about them. I'll get into that in a minute. Now, there are a number of things that happen, according to Scripture, immediately following Jesus' birth. Here's a few of them. First, in order, the visit of the shepherds, right? The shepherds come, and they share the good news with their neighbors. They go tell it on the mountain. And they were first informed of the angels in the middle of that Bethlehem field. In fact, by the way, one of the myths of Christmas is that Jesus was born on December 25th. We don't really know that for sure. Uh, The fact that the shepherds are out in their fields watching over their flocks by night is a cue that some people believe that they were in lambing season when lambs were being born. And if so, that would have been in the early spring. So uh, you can move that forward. Uh, We can celebrate again in March if you want to. The second thing that happens, which is very interesting and often overlooked, is that eight days later, Jesus is circumcised. And so that would have happened in the home, and uh, Jesus would be circumcised, and he's officially made visibly part of the covenant community following the law of Moses. And that's important because Jesus fulfilled the law in every way throughout his entire life, including the obligation of all male children to be circumcised on the eighth day. And that is the day in which he actually officially receives his name, Yeshua. We talked about Yeshua, his name, which means Yahweh saves. 
Uh, the next thing that happens in Jesus' life is at the 40th day, they bring him to the temple and he is dedicated to the Lord. Joseph and Mary, being poor, do not have the resources for a full sacrifice, but they bring a pair of uh, turtle doves or pigeons, which is the poor person's sacrifice in order to dedicate a child at the temple. And of course, that brings on Simeon and Anna, who prophesy and pray and are just wonderfully excited about this new babe that has been born. And uh, the next thing that we know of happening is a long while later, perhaps, it is the visit of the wise men, the magi. And uh, so that's what we want to talk about here today is the Magi. The Magi, the wise men, came relatively later. And we'll uh, talk about a few ways that we know that. Uh, first of all, it said that they came to the house. So some people have said, hey, well, he's no longer in the manger. He's been uh, promoted to living in a house. And uh, pr that obviously took place a little bit later. Although we don't necessarily you get the wrong picture if you think that Jesus was in some kind of a shack on the top of a hill with a light shining down that we always see as the images of Jesus. He was probably already in a house. He was just in the lower level because there was no room in the guest room is the better way to translate that. So perhaps that's a cue that the wise men came later because they come to the house. Probably the clearer sign that we know about how much later the wise men came is that Herod asks when they first saw that star appear. And they report some point in time, which we're not told. But when Herod, in anger and vengeance, goes to slay all the children in Bethlehem, all the, all the male children, he goes for all children two and younger. So therefore, we think the Magi came somewhere within the first two years, at least two years after the star arose. We don't know if the star arose when he was born or prior to his birth, maybe when he was conceived or prior to that time entirely. But... According to Herod, it's within the first two years, and we're going to go with that for now. Now, who were these wise men? People have uh, gotten lots of guesses. Their, their name actually is Magi. That's the word from which we get magician. They're from the East, which means they're probably some mixture of pagan, Gentile, maybe Zoroastrian, Eastern religion, somewhere from the realm of where Daniel was in exile. And perhaps they've read some holy books and they've gone through some annals and they've read some things and that's what gives them uh, this identity. What, whatever we know though, they are men of the East and what they represent though is that somebody beyond the Jewish nation is coming to worship the king of the Jews. That's the important thing that Matthew is looking at here today is that the nations are coming to his appearing. And the wise men serve as that harbinger, that first um, indication that all the nations are going to come and worship before the Lord, for kingship belongs to our God, and he rules over all the nations. Frederick Dale Bruner, in his commentary, uh, calls this humanity under grace. And here we see some acts of grace that God is doing through the Magi. Now, uh, were there, how many were there? You know, if we were to do a multiple choice question and say, pick the best one. Uh, we could start with one, but that would be the wrong answer because there's plural, wise men. We could say two because there's, there's men, plural, but there's three gifts. So we've often said that there's three of them, but actually the gifts are not necessarily one per person. We just have kind of made up some legends about how many wise men there were. Maybe there were seven wise men. Maybe there were more than three. We don't know, uh, but what we do know is that they did bring their three gifts. Now, some have looked at the gifts. In fact, the song we sang this morning was symbolic of those gifts, right? Gold is what? Kingship, uh, frankincense, his deity, and myrrh, his burial. Uh, but you put too much on the, on the wise men that they actually knew those things. For a king, they didn't even know where to find his address. Uh, they probably didn't have some sense of the symbolism of even what they were bringing. Perhaps Matthew does, however, as he's writing his gospel and he looks at these gifts and maybe they brought more than just three gifts, we're not told, but they did bring these three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. At minimum, we can give Matthew credit for uh, pointing us toward the story of Jesus through those gifts. And how about that star? All right, so one more other big question we get to with the wise men is, what in the world was this star or constellation that they've seen? Uh, some astro astronomy scholars have gone and tried to look back to the timing of Jesus' birth and say, well, this thing was happening in the, st in the constellations, or maybe there was a comet or something that they were following. We really don't know, frankly. Perhaps my best guess is that they saw some kind of star formation that emerged and arose um, and 
came to light in the night skies. They were probably astronomers or maybe uh, they were into some kind of level of cosmetology. And there's some signs in the stars that indicate to them that there was a king who was being born who was a king of the Jews. We don't really know too much about what it means, though, however, that the star, when they saw it, rose and went forth before them until it came to rest over where the child was. Because we all know stars don't actually do that. They don't move. They don't rest in a specific geographic location. So that gets us back to the comment. But be that as it may, uh, they were unable to find um, Jesus without some help. So these are all the things we don't know about the wise men. What I'd like to talk about is what we do know about the wise men. And there are three things I want to observe today about the wise men. Things we can know as observations from the text. Are you ready? Here they are. The three things we need to observe. Number one, the wise men are sincere seekers, not closed cynics. Number two, the wise men are true worshipers, not religious posers. Number three, they are generous givers, not selfish consumers. Let's look at these one at a time. Sincere seekers, not closed cynics. We get this from the first uh, opening verses of this passage. Think about what it required for the wise men to seek Jesus. It's a bit of work, wasn't it? Let's go back in time to wherever they came from in the East. They were doing the work of observation. They were paying attention to the signs. They were sincerely seeking, believing that they were going to find some answers the more they saw it. I don't know if you uh, remember writing research papers when you were either in high school or college. I do. What a painful experience writing a research paper. You know what I mean? You get all these books out of the library. You don't have time to read them all. So you go to the index <laughs> and you try to find a few quotes and you start writing on, we're supposed to do three by five cards, right? So you write down on a three by five card and you have no idea where this information that you just put on that three by five card is going to fit in your paper, but you just do it anyways because that's the assignment. And at the end of the day, you got a bunch of three by five cards if you did your assignment the right way. And now it's time to write your paper. And uh, there's just a lot of seeking. And when you seek, here's the thing. There's a lot of places you look that don't ever get in the paper that you write. There's a lot of dead ends when you're seeking. When you're seeking and you haven't found it yet, like it's the same as hide and seek, right? You have to look in this place, nope. You have to look in this place, no. Look in this place, no. There's all these dead ends that you get to when you're seeking. Being an observer and seeking after the Lord requires some persistence and endurance. You can't just kind of say, well, we tried it, we looked, And we didn't find anything, so back to bed. We're done. No. These men were observing. They were studying the stars, perhaps some ancient books. They were looking at the timing of things. Also, they counted the cost, didn't they? I mean, they knew they were going to go on this long journey, however long it was. They were going to be on foot, or maybe they brought camels with them. We think that they're camels. The camels are in my major scene, so I think they rode a camel. And... um, but that took a lot of planning, you know? Uh, I've, I was thinking about a trip our family took a couple of years ago between Christmas and New Year's, and we vowed never, ever again to drive to Florida, and never again over Christmas, because there was just like the whole 95 going south was a parking lot, and our GPS, the whole time we're going, is saying that we're even longer time away from our GPS the longer we drive. It's backwards. It's terrible. Sometimes trips can have unexpected. In fact, I think every trip has some unexpected surprises, doesn't it? So think about what they did. They, they counted the cost. They planned this trip. They packed up their things. They brought enough food and provisions to get from place to place. And um, they brought their gifts, all that stuff. They had to uh, get ready by doing out-of-office notifications with their email and their phone. They just had to get it all done so that they could go on this big trip. And we don't even know how long it took them. Also, they have a lot of endurance, right? They're walking and riding hundreds of miles. Uh, They're not uh, being done when arriving to the palace even, right? They get to the palace to Herod. They say, hey, we're here for the birthday party. And Herod's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. They're like, okay, well, let's find out some more information. We're still seeking even though we haven't gotten the answer. Let's translate that into our lives here today. In, In a relevant way, what does it mean for us to be seekers of God's truth? Well, we too, like the wise men, need to make observations, don't we? Truth doesn't just come to us, right? You can't just like open TikTok and find out some great truth that you didn't know you needed. Well, sometimes you do. (laughs) 
But truly seeking takes diligent study. Maybe you need to uh, ask some questions about who is Jesus if you're really a seeker and you're not yet in knowledge of who he is. You also have to count the cost, knowing that if you're going to go on this journey of seeking after Jesus and finding him, it's going to be costly to you. You have to change your perspective about where your priorities are if you're going to live a life that is following him. It also means endurance. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, it means that we have to really deal wisely and not give up when human leaders disappoint us with apathy or sinfulness or misdirections. This is very common today in our age because people are deconstructing their faith. They're looking at people who have failed them within the Christian culture, within evangelicalism or Protestantism or Catholicism. And they're saying, you know what? These are bad. These are blind guides. Maybe I'll just kind of find my own way. I'm just going to give up on the, re- the revealed word of God and the teachings of the church. And I'm going to find my own way because these leaders have disappointed me, much like Herod must have disappointed the wise men. So there's a lot of pressing in if we're going to be seekers of the truth. If we were to put the Magi, the wise men, on our discipleship path, if you recall here at Grace Covenant, we have a discipleship path that begins with not interested, spiritually curious, new believer, growing disciple, and disciple maker. Those are the five points that we've identified in every disciple's journey. And if we were to put the wise men on this map, where would we put them? I put them under spiritually curious. Very good, Don. That's right. They are curious, aren't they? They are seeking, but they don't yet have the answer. They're looking, but they don't yet have knowledge. They are uh, ready to worship. They've brought gifts to lay at Jesus' feet, but they don't know where to put them yet. They are spiritually curious. Spiritually curious is a great place to begin. And maybe that's what God is calling you to do out of this passage, is to just continue to be spiritually curious about Jesus and his truth. Isaiah 55, 6 says these words, Seek the Lord while, be, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Or how about Jeremiah? Jeremiah 29 says this, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. Seeking means calling out. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this promise, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. What a great promise. If you're spiritually curious today, I want to invite you to pursue and seek the Lord with your whole heart, not just half-heartedly, not just half the journey, but to actually go the full distance in finding the truth of who Jesus is until you're fixed in your mind that you know for sure whether he was a Lord or a liar or a lunatic or a legend. He's one of those four, and we've come to believe that he's the Lord, and we'd love to help you walk with that path if you're spiritually curious and you want more help. There's lots of patient people here in our congregation which would love to hear your questions, love to point you in the directions that we found, and uh, look for that path of how how to find Jesus. And here's the promise of Jeremiah 29, verse 14. I will be found by you, says the Lord. Seekers that seek with their whole heart, find the Lord. All right, before we wrap up this point here about the Magi being sincere seekers, not closed cynics, I just want to note a few contrasts that emerge in the passage. We're going to do this with all three points. Is look at some contrasts. So the Magi are sincere seekers, not closed cynics. Now, in contrast, what is Herod's foil in this drama? Herod is closed, right? He is a cynic. He's fearful. He won't take the trouble to walk beyond the palace walls to go and pursue this king. What are his words after all, right? He says to the magi, to the wise men, he says, go and make a careful search for the child. And when you come back, report to me that I may go and worship him. Well, first of all, we know he wants nothing to do with worshiping Jesus. What does he want to do? He wants to eliminate Jesus, which is why the the wise men will go back by another way. But he's, I mean, he's so closed, he won't even take any steps at all. Even though the Sunday school answer from the, um, the prophets and the scribes and the chief priests have come to him, that it's happening in Bethlehem. It's not far from his palace, by the way. I mean, like a day's journey. He could make it. 
These, these wise men came hundreds and hundreds of miles, days and weeks, maybe months of journeying, and he won't go half a day's journey to go find this child. The other contrast here is that Jesus is the one who is to be sought. He is the holy child. And so there is a seeking and finding, and the wise men do find what they're looking for. Let's follow them in their search. Where, where will they land? Look, look at me at verse 9 of chapter 2. After listening to the king, the wise men went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. This is a pretty exciting moment, right? They, are, they can taste it. They're at their, they can see the finish line. They've been running this marathon, and they've come into the um, Great Colosseum, and now they just have a few more laps to run until they get to that. They know they're circling in on the destination where they're going. They see the star. They rejoice exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down, and they worshiped him. So here's the second point. The wise men are true worshipers, not religious posers. Do you know what I mean by posers? A poser is a person who kind of looks the part, but they don't actually do the part. Uh, when I was growing up, the posers were the, the, the kids that like, liked to have a skateboard, but they really couldn't do the half pipe. You know, they could pose for their like, uh, eighth grade picture with a cool skateboard, but there were no scratches on that skateboard. There were no uh, bumped up knees and bruises underneath their clothing because they were just a poser. They looked like skateboarders, but they weren't anything like it. The real kids had mangled up skateboards, their wheels were all burned down, and they had a lot of bruises to show for it. They were the real deal. Uh, here in this text, Herod is the poser, isn't he? He is the false king who is afraid of the true king. He doesn't want to give his worship. He wants to give his intentions to murder. And in contrast here, we see that the wise men are intent on worshiping. They come and the very first act that they do as soon as they have encountered Christ is they come and they, they worship him. It even says they bow down and worshiped him. You know, it's interesting. We were singing those words this morning and, you know, it says bow down before him. And I'm thinking, how many of us actually have enough intentionality or enough intensity in worship that we would bow down and not feel self-conscious before other people. For how many of us, we, we come and we, like, honestly, we're like very tidy. We're very bound up, you know? And some of you are hand raisers and I love that. I think that's really great. I do it too. But some of us are just kind of like, I don't know, can I say it? Posers? I don't know your heart. I hope you really worship the Lord, but look at what the wise men do. They, they don't care about the audience around them because there's only, only an audience of one. They're there to bow down. They fall down and they worship him because they love him so much. This thing that they've been seeking, I'm sure the camera's like missing me right now, so I'm down here on the floor. They, they come and they bow down. They worship Jesus. They act like they are in the presence of royalty. They demonstrate with their bodies the affections that they have for the Christ. And they don't care that other people might think something else. Maybe the shepherds are long gone by now anyways. But they actually take a posture of worship. Is that your heart? We have to, we have, I think there's a growth area for all of us that we can grow to be true worshipers. You know, it's, it's easy to get in the habit of being consistent at Sunday worship, but not really be engaged in private worship. I want to encourage you as you enter this new year, there's maybe one resolution that you can make that will be the most life-transforming thing is to really pursue worshiping the Lord with all of your heart. Because not only do we have to seek the Lord with all of our heart, we're called to worship the Lord our God and serve him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. That is the life of devotion we're called to give him. Implicit in the joy of worship is always an invitation for other people to join with you in worship. Think about the words of Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. If you read through the Psalms, you'll hear this over and over again. The words of worship are often a, come join me in worshiping because I found what my heart most 
wants. This act of worship marks the transition for the wise men. They are now gone on the this, on this spiritual journey, on the discipleship path, from seeker, from curious, spiritually curious, to new believer. How do I know that? Because worship is the pivot. Worship is the pivot, the fulcrum on which discipleship changes. When you recognize Jesus for who he is and you worship him, now he is your Lord and now you are his disciple. There's no turning back once you become a true worshiper in spirit and in truth. He is deserving of all of our worship. He is deserving of our allegiance, our obedience, our life of service. And it's not a dour or reluctant, yes, Lord, like my kids answering me or request to unload the dishwasher, yes, Dad, but a joyful, yes, Lord, an obedience that rings with life because we found him who is the true life and nothing he can ask is too much for us to do. Their act of worship is a signal of the value of Christ Jesus. And Matthew, as the author, wants us to see it very clearly here in this passage, that their act of worship tells us not so much who they are, but who Jesus is. After all, it's in Matthew 4, just two chapters later, that Jesus, when confronted by the devil, will respond to the devil, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Those are Jesus' words. And yet Jesus receives the worship of the wise man, because he's worthy. And Matthew is telling us, the person who is worshipped in this book I'm writing is the person you should worship to and the person you should follow and give your life to as a life of a disciple. And we see, you know, those disciples for all their faults and failures as they go through the journey of learning who Jesus is. By the end of the book of Matthew, they've got it. Don't they? Matthew chapter 28, right before the Great Commission happens, we hear these words. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they what? They worshiped him. They worshiped him. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is there. He's about to tell them their marching orders. And why are they willing to do those marching orders? Because they're worshipers. And when you become a worshiper, you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus. He is your Lord and you will do things that he asks of you. No matter how difficult they may seem, how challenging they may feel. Now, some contrasts as we go into this point here, as we're talking about them being true worshipers, not posers. Of course, we've got this great contrast, right? While the wise men are bent on worship, Herod is bent on murder. He will not bow down and worship the true king. He will seek to slaughter rivals to his throne. There are ultimately only two paths, the path of the worshiper and the path of rebellion. We can feign indifference for a while as Herod did, but ultimately our heart is going one of two ways, either toward worshiping and exalting and lifting up Jesus or to ignoring and living life our own way and even trying to get Jesus out of our lives. There's really ultimately only two ways. We can kind of be on that in-between space, that liminal time for a little while, but ultimately, your life and mine is going to be directed by our response to who Jesus is. From this pivotal encounter, the Magi, the wise men, will live lives of grace. This now brings me to the third point about the wise men. So not only are they sincere seekers, not closed cynics, and not only are they true worshipers, not merely posers, but they are generous givers, not selfish consumers. Look with me at verses, uh, the second half of verse 11 and following. After they fell down and they worshiped him, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. You see, growing disciples are consumers, are not consumers, but are givers. A growing disciple lives their life out loud, lives their love out loud in some way that's manifesting the lordship and the obedience of Jesus Christ in their lives. They take part in offering their gifts to the king. 
gold, frankincense, and myrrh, at least from a practical perspective, are wealth that is worthy of a king. But it's not only beautiful, it's also going to prove very practical. These objects of gold and frankincense and myrrh are those things that have a very dense level of value, don't they? Because they are so valuable, you can bring a small amount and it has great value. This will serve Joseph and Mary as they're about to make a flight into Egypt, which happens in the second half of this chapter. They are going to actually need this provision for their unexpected journey as they become refugees in a foreign land in Egypt where they are going to hide for several years until Herod's death. Sounds like the wise man's gift came just in time. So contrasts. The wise men give years of their life generously and give their resources in abundance. Herod takes the life of newborn children in a local infanticide. And through it all, we see Jesus, the Christ child, who comes to give his life for us all. We might look at the wise men and say, wow, what great sacrifice they made. But it's nothing in comparison with the sacrifice that Jesus gave when he gave his life, both in his active obedience and his passive obedience in the cross for you and for me. You see, in Christianity, no one outgives the Lord. You can't do it. Our gift is just but a token, a symbol, a gesture, a response to the great gift that Jesus has given us in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And all those who come to be his worshipers find that they don't actually lose for having given to him, but they gain by coming to his footstool. If I'm saved by my performance, then I will just do enough to please him and then stop. But if I'm, sh if I'm saved by sheer grace, there is nothing he can't ask of me that I won't joyfully hand over because he's worthy of all that I give. We'll have more to say about this next week. But in, in closing, let's just observe the discipleship path of the Magi. I think I'd ask it backwards, this question. If you're not generous, the question is, where is your worship? If you're not a worshiper, the question is, where is your seeking? If you're a seeker, if you're not a seeker, now is the best time to start. Jesus wants us to follow this path forward of seeking and finding him, of giving ourselves to him in worship, and also giving ourselves in our life with our time and our treasure and our talent. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the real center of this story. that wise men come to seek you and find you and worship you. Rebellious men go their own way and don't find you to be a satisfying savior or king. Thank you that you are worthy of our worship and our gifts. As we enter this new year, Lord, we commit ourselves to pursuing you, seeking you, worshiping you, and being transformed in our everyday life because we have met you and encountered you. Of all the things that we don't know about the wise men, we thank you that we do know these three things, that they sincerely sought you, that they truly worshiped you, and that they gave generously. Make us be like those kind of people in response to your greatness and your glory, your kingship, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.